Um, so first tell me what are your practices to stay spiritually and mentally grounded? Well, um, you know, I think that, 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 at least for me, I try to think about when you talk about being spiritually and mentally grounded, I think about it holistically. So what are the things that keep me healthy? One is prayer, for sure. You know, prayer is very important to me. It's part, part of what I learned growing up. You know, my, my parents made me go to Sunday school growing up, and we went to church, and we had to pray. And, you know, and we prayed before every meal and gave thanks. And so as soon as I wake up in the morning, I get down on my knees and I say a prayer of thanks for waking me up and a prayer for, for blessings for people other than myself in this day. Mm -hmm. uh, before I go to sleep at night, I get down on my knees and I say a prayer. Thank you for getting me through this day and for a blessed sleep and restful sleep and, and, and pray for other folks. And, and then I pray before I eat. So those prayer points are ritualistic points for me uh, that help me. That's number one. Mm -hmm. um, number two, uh, I go to church as much as I can. One of the things I liked about your books um, is how you, you speak personally to the person in the letter. Yes. I think it's um, very effective because it's, it's just a casual conversation that's easier received. Um, your book, The Wealth Cure, Putting um, Money in Its Place, I know that that was a, a big book for you because it dealt with your personal struggle with thyroid cancer. Um, how has getting thyroid cancer changed your life? Or mm -hmm. how has it changed the way you see things or think about things? And um, tell me a little bit about you know, the parallel you wrote in the book between wealth and financial wealth mm -hmm. and health. Well, you know, first of all, the thing with thyroid cancer that really was troubling to me because thyroid, if you're going to get cancer, thyroid is one of the best ones to get. So let's just put it, you know, let's put it that way. You, you know, thyroid's a good one because it has a high cure rate. Mm -hmm. And so that's good, you know, so it's curable. Uh, uh, oftentimes it's slower moving than a lot of other cancers. So those, mm -hmm. those are a lot of good things. Um, you know, one wants to get cancer, but if you're going to get it, that's yeah. good to get. Problem for me, though, was my father mm -hmm. also got it and around the same age I am. And didn't and your he, grandfather and My grandfather well. died of cancer, and he has died since of cancer. A different type of cancer, but, and then my, right. his brother died of cancer. So the men in my family, on the paternal side, mm -hmm. all of them have died of cancer. And it's a, it's a, it's a so, so there's an imprint that I have, right. you know, uh, certainly, a proclivity, let's say, uh, you know, Hopefully, I got some more of my mother's genes in that regard than my father's potentially, and and, and hopefully, uh, uh, thyroid cancer will be the last cancer that I'm confronted with. Um, how has I mean, it how how's it changed you? Well, it's that changed experience. me in the sense it's 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 really reinforced to me that life is so short and precious, uh, and I think that. Most of us, what we do is we live our life almost like the moon cycle. In other words, when we're younger, 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 it's, it's all about the future, the future, the future, the future, the future. It's the, the moon's getting bigger in the month, bigger, 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 future, 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 future. And for some of us at some point, and, and I'm saying it's different ages for different people, we feel like we're on the backside of our life. So life is getting smaller, smaller. I'm getting older, older, older. I'm not, as, I'm not as slim as I used to be. I'm just, everything is downhill. So, so it's, it's uphill, downhill. And life really isn't that. And that's what thyroid cancer made me realize. There's no up and down. There's no guarantee that it's this or that or how long it's going to be, or it's going to be even for you, or not even. What life really is, is a series of days that you put together. Mm -hmm. And how are you going to live those days? And, and to me, I'm reminded that, you know, I wrote a book called The Conversation, which was a relationship book. One of the best interviews I did was with a very elderly couple who had, their, their marriage had lasted for 60 plus years. And I said, how did you make your marriage last 60 plus years when most people are getting divorced? And I don't know. They said, you know what, all we did was didn't think about 60 years, didn't think about 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. Mm -hmm. We just thought every morning, figure out a way to love each other today. 
And some days that didn't work too well, some days it worked better. But it's just about, if you think about how much it is, whether it's the future or, oh my God, I missed my youth, mm -hmm. you're missing out. What it is, is today. Are you living the best life you can live today, right now? And if you're not, make a change, make a difference. You talked about your book, The Conversations, um, and I, I read part of the book. Um, in it, you said that 33% of African American people, only 33% of African Americans grow up in a two-parent home. Yes. And then you compare it with Latino, Caucasian, and I was astonished Huge by the percentage. Despair. Huge despair. And, I mean, why is that? And you, what did you find in your findings and your research? And you know, I know it's you a, interviewed it's, a lot it's of people. Multiple. It's, 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 it's almost. A, that was it. when I read a that. Perfect it was, storm, confluence of horrific events that have caused this reality. But it's horrendous. What were you gonna say when you read it? You know, uh, when I read it, I I was so um, I felt so discouraged by that. Just by seeing that number compared to to other. Um, communities. It, it was just very discouraging to me. It is a very discouraging number. Because um, you're talking about 68% Latino, you're talking about 80% Asian, you're talking about 70 some percent Caucasian, and then we're at 33% of kids growing up in two parent households. And every data point tells us that kids tend to do better mm -hmm. in terms of education, in terms of wealth, in terms of happiness in terms of all these factors when they grow up in a two-parent household, yeah. when they get love from yeah. a male and a female. Because you, you know, anyone, you need both that. You need the male, you need the woman, Absolutely. that's it. So what we're experiencing is that, I mean, you can go back, you can take it all the way back to slave times mm -hmm. when, when they would purposely break up families. Then you can even take, you know, so, so we can talk about structural things. Yeah. Um, and then you could you even talk about another structural thing that happened 60s, 70s with welfare when they wouldn't pay welfare if there was a, a, a male in the home. So the male left yeah. so that the kids could get welfare. Uh, you know, this is, these are all poverty type policies that were really problematic. But then you can also focus on incarceration. You can mm -hmm. focus on the fact that we're talking about another generation that's growing up without that example. And you can yeah. also talk about what I talk about in the book is that when young women don't experience platonic love in the home from like a father or male mm -hmm. figure, they're used to being in negotiation their whole life with men. In other words, men wanting something from them, yeah. right? And therefore, it creates problematic relationships down the line, mm -hmm. suspicion, and uh, you know all sorts of things. Yeah. So, so there's a whole lot of reasons, a whole no host of reasons that have kind of created a perfect storm. But it's something that's that's, that's possible to solve. Um, you know, and, and yeah. I, I'm an advocate of two parent households. And I don't care what the parents look like. Yeah. You understand? Is they you know it, they don't have to be uh, both bliggity bliggity black. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, that, and that's the only thing a black family can be. You right. know. I, I, I'm a big fan of two parents, and if you happen to be in a situation where that's impossible, then find yeah. outside people mm -hmm. to fulfill these platonic love roles. Yeah. And you don't have to date them. They can just be people that fulfill those roles. Yeah. What, I know that you're a big art fan. You love mm -hmm. art. I love art. What is it about art that fascinates you? You know, art is so personal because one person can look at the same painting, photograph, and have, what is that? And the other person, and then somebody else can be like, whoa. And it's so unique. And to me, what artists do is are, are they see the world in a different way. And I think that what moves me about art is, particularly contemporary art, that's kind of my, mm -hmm. my, my, my what, what I really love, is that they most great artists are attempting to show you a reality in a way that's different than the way you see it. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and so I'm always fascinated by that. You know, is the way I see you in the world actually how it is? Or, is, or, is, or can, we, can all of this be interpreted And it's funny because we all, we all forget that 
you're you're only seeing the world from you. Exactly. You only have you only can they see things from your perspective. Yes. And as people, we always assume that the other person has our seeing perspective. Seeing it the exact way we are. And then you yeah. realize, oh, I never thought of it that way. So. And that's what art does. So I, the, art lets me think. When I see Picasso and the way he draws someone's nose over here and their mm -hmm. eye up here, and this, and it's incredible. And you're like, wow, that's the way he saw this person. Yeah. That's the way he wanted to represent that person. You know. And there's a, you know, there's so many wonderful pieces. Uh, and, and I just love it. I just got back from Vienna where we were shooting Covert Affairs, and and they have so many amazing art galleries. There's a, Belvedere, the Albertina, the Leopold Museum, the Mumok, um, the Secession. So I went to all of those museums and saw so much mm -hmm. great work and got introduced to artists I'd never even heard of that are geniuses. And so it's just, you know, it's everywhere. And it's one of the great joys of my life is to experience art, whether it's this art that I purchase or, or in a museum. What is it at this point in your life, what is it that you want? in the future. What do you want from this point forward? I think it comes down for me impact and legacy. Um, and obviously positive impact. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of people that have impact. You can just do something that have impact that's not necessarily positive, but it's just impactful. Mm -hmm. um, and then there and there's some people that have legacy but not necessarily positive, like go out and just have a bunch of babies. And you have legacy but if you're not raising <laughs> your kids, you know, it's not great. But I want to have positive impact and positive legacy. Mm -hmm. uh, build something, build businesses, institutions, nonprofits, art, build things that will last beyond me. What? Hopefully have a family, hopefully have kids that last beyond me. Have legacy. But not just legacy for legacy's sake, legacy that also had positive impact. Mm -hmm. Made the world better. If I'm playing in a movie or a TV show, have people enjoy it or get removed from it or laugh or cry or whatever impact. Um, if I have a nonprofit, have it affect young people's lives. If I write books, have the books actually have impact on somebody's life. The content of the book actually change mm -hmm. their life. So positive impact and legacy is what it's about for me. One of the biggest things I noticed about artists, um, entertainers, is that they tend to have that grain where they think really big and they Say, say, I want to, to impact, leave an impact and a legacy. And some people don't even think that big. Where did you get that seed from? Have you always been that way? I've always been that way. There's never been a point in my life that I can remember, even as a young child, where I knew that I would always paint on big canvases and want to paint on big canvases. Um, it's, just, it's just who I, I am and how I was raised. Um, you know, always.